Hello, everyone. I'm Janet Salmons, Methods Guru for Sage Method Space, and I'm thrilled today to be joined by John Cresswell and Johanna Cresswell Baez um, to talk about the new edition of 30 Essential Skills for Qualitative Researchers. Now, before we get started, if you're new to Method Space, just like to uh, introduce this blog community that is uh, sponsored by Sage Publications. And we're interested in all things to do with designing, conducting, analyzing research, writing about it, sharing it in all kinds of ways. And then at the heart of this Venn diagram, you can see teaching and learning because we hope that people will um, have a chance to learn new skills or new ideas and approaches on uh, whether you're a student or an experienced researcher. So um, let's get started. And why don't you uh, introduce yourselves? Go ahead, Joanna, you can begin. All right, thanks. Uh, we, first of all, we are honored to be here. So thank you, Janet, for having us on. I'm a fan of Methods Face. I've been uh, following it and kind of dipping my toe in on different topics. So really excited to be here. My name is Joanna Cresswell Baez, and I'm the manager of course development at Columbia University School of Social Work. I'm also an adjunct assistant professor and a Robert Wood Johnson fellow uh, through the Clinical Scholars Program. Uh, my research there is qualitative, and uh, we are uh, amplifying the stories of youth who've crossed the southern US border by themselves. Um, I'm also a social worker. Uh, let me pass it over to my dad. Okay, John Cresswell. Well, I'm speaking to you from uh, Osaka, Japan. Uh, I live in two places, uh, Osaka, Japan, and in Honolulu. And because of this pandemic, I'm here in Osaka until at least January. Uh, I work at the University of Michigan as a part-time faculty in family medicine. Uh, my title is Senior Research Scientist. And I go to Michigan uh, several times. Now I go virtually to help them with workshops and to help them with consulting. Uh, I've been writing research methods books for over 30 years. I have six books that are very active right now, two on research design, uh, two on qualitative research, and two on mixed methods research. And I'm delighted to collaborate with my talented daughter in this new edition of the 30 Essential Skills book. So that's a good uh, lead in because I was hoping that you would discuss uh, your process for working on this book and uh, the ways that you work together, partly because our method space readers are often not only researchers, but also writers. So they're interested in um, the process that, that people use to when they're working together to create a, a new book. So the 30 essential skills actually had a pretty long runway that began with the first edition uh, between the two of us. At that time, I was working on my dissertation and needing some ideas and advice. Uh, meanwhile, uh, my dad um, is working on the first edition of it and testing out pieces, right? This is for a, a novice qualitative researcher. And um, at that time, I was a bit more novice. So it was exciting to see it come together and him, you know, I've got this chapter, I'm thinking about it. It's on creating codes. Can you take a look at it? Um, and uh, that was a couple, you know, um, a while ago. Yeah, the first edition of this book was published in uh, 2016, but it actually came from uh, my teaching an introductory course mm -hmm. on qualitative research. And I had a graduate assistant in that class. And after every class, he would share with me the questions that students were asking. Mm -hmm. And so I organized uh, the chapters, uh, roughly two chapters, per classroom session for 15 sessions during the semester. And so uh, 
that's how the book really got started. But there's an interesting collaboration process. Uh, Joanna, Joanna, tell them a little bit about this chart that's before yeah. us. Yeah. Yeah, so I'm pretty techy and I like uh, exploring new tech tools. And this uh, was a template by my collaborators. I work with the online campus and help manage the online campus at Columbia Social Work. Um, and they created this to work collaboratively. One of my colleagues is in LA, uh, the other one is in New Orleans and uh, my supervisor is in New York City. And so we were using this to check boxes off and complete tasks and keep each other updated with notes and comments. And I thought, what a great way to work on revisions. Um, I had an article that I was working on with a collaborator working in revisions, and this, this was working out well. So I took it to my dad and explained it and took, we, we went through the, um, the, uh, the feedback from the reviewers, and you can kind of see that in this left-hand column, the purple, our blue column is checking in when we got it done, and we had notes that we would each kind of write back and forth. Um, and these are some of the major changes that we were uh, working on. So this helped us keep us real focused uh, in our writing and our work and helped us collaborate. Some, sometimes we were in, I, I'm down here in Austin, Texas. So sometimes we were down here in Austin, Texas and other times he was in Osaka, Japan or Hawaii. So we really needed some tools to help us bridge mm -hmm. the distance as we collaborated. Yeah, our, our sage editor, I love this table. It, it, I have to admit it's much more systematic for doing a revision than I've ever done before. <laughs> but uh, that right hand column would indicate, you know, what we're putting back into the next edition, in the second edition. Mm -hmm. And we need to also mention that, you know, not all reviewers comments did we incorporate, but mm -hmm. we incorporated many of them. And if we disagreed with a particular comment, then on that right-hand column, we would put some notes as to mm -hmm. why we disagreed. And uh, this way, Sage has a plan for right. revision, and they can see exactly how our revision uh, fits the reviewer's comment. So this is very helpful. Mm -hmm. Let's go to the next one, where we can talk a little bit about the updating of this. Right. So uh, when, when you were talking a moment ago about how you kind of, you know, grew this book out of your teaching, um, mm -hmm. which I think, you know, that, you know, what I've learned from my students certainly helped to strengthen my books and just, you know, having the kinds of questions mm -hmm. that they ask. And when I was uh, reading the book and looking at the preface in the early part of the book, that described the um, not only the the updates but also how it related to teaching. I was hoping that you could uh, talk a little bit more about that. How the updates relate to teaching? Uh, well, uh, I'll be incorporating these as I teach. Right now, uh, we are doing a series of workshops in Osaka. We started the Institute for Southeast Asian Institute for Research Methods, and we offer workshops and we'll be doing some webinars too. Yeah. So these new features of this book will fit into mm -hmm. some of the presentations, topics like uh, the sampling issues that are very important in quality research, uh, the interview data collection issues, how you analyze, and uh, also, you know, using worldviews or theoretical models in your mm -hmm. qualitative research. These are all important topics that we hope to be doing some webinars on out of our institute. Yeah, and I find the chapters are a quick read. I don't know if you were mm -hmm. noticing that, Janet, and they just, it's really easy to take it in and have some um, new knowledge quickly. I'm going to be doing a workshop next week to doctoral students at Columbia University. And I, uh, you know, gave them a couple of chapters uh, to look at and just really easy to move through those and get some basic pieces like the chapter on how to create codes, um, 
I also use it in teaching uh, my other, I'm on a, a team uh, mm -hmm. of clinical scholars. And so we come from different backgrounds. It's interdisciplinary. So I've used different pieces. We submitted an abstract uh, the other week for, um, for our qualitative research. And we were opening back up and I was sending the chapter on how to create a title and think about these mm -hmm. different pieces. So uh, we're definitely using them in lots of different ways and finding it helpful in teaching um, new, new qualitative researchers. Of all the books that I've written and the new editions, and that number is now about 30, this book is unquestionably the most practical mm -hmm. uh, book that I've written. It's really a how-to book. And I wanted to orient this book just like my students in my qualitative class that I was teaching when I first developed it, I want to orient it to the new qualitative researcher. And certainly here in Southeast Asia, when I'm in Indonesia or Thailand, or even here in Japan, qualitative research is new. Mm -hmm. And so if they can see a book uh, where they're introduced in an easy format to this, and uh, I share my personal ways of doing qualitative research. I think that's very helpful. Mm -hmm. I need to mention this too about the second edition, this new edition. You know, Joanna has a very strong social justice background mm -hmm. through her master's program at Columbia and through her doctorate at Smith College. And so this, has, this edition has a much stronger social justice orientation, where we're talking about the issues of importance to underrepresented groups. Right. And I think that's very timely today. Yes. And Joanna also brought into this new edition specific examples from her dissertation project to illustrate how she actually engaged in qualitative research. So that's a feature, uh, and new references as well, too. Mm -hmm. So that's a feature that really distinguishes a second edition from a first. Uh, you know, when you do a new edition, you're adding updated references, you're adding new sections that the reviewers mention to be included. Mm -hmm. uh, you're bringing in uh, more recent studies, more recent mm -hmm. published studies as examples. Mm -hmm. But the, the social justice orientation, I think, is much stronger here. And I think that's a welcomed uh, change mm -hmm. for my work and for this edition. Yeah, it was great to pull out articles that really have a social justice focus and use them as exemplars uh, to weave it throughout every piece of this book. So I think that, that it, it is very timely and of great interest to uh, current researchers and researchers who we've been talking a lot with this year um, through various method space channels who are having to reframe their studies because they can't conduct them the way they originally planned, mm -hmm. but also feeling that the problems, you know, are more um, imminent, shall we say, to people's lives. And, you know, so the need for more attention to, you know, real uh, impact. Yeah, so I think anything, the, uh, is there uh, anything else from this um, slide that you would like to share? Or? Well, I, I just want to mention one more thing. Because of the, the short chapters and the rather straightforward talk on how to do a particular procedure, mm -hmm. uh, this book is being adopted in other countries around the world. And right now, my wife, Dr. Mariko Hirose Cresswell, is doing a Japanese translation of this mm -hmm. book. And that'll be out very shortly. And so uh, because of the way we organized and presented the short chapters and, and uh, the content of the book, I think it's really accessible for translations into many different languages. Let's go to the next one, shall we? Um, a very, 
uh, popular chapters, the chapter on interviews and uh, this on the right hand side, the sample interview protocol. Um, people time and time again say that this is a really helpful and practical, useful tool. I use it when I go back to creating my interviews of the different pieces, the key pieces that I want to have in there opening up with an icebreaker. These content questions are tell me more and please explain. And it's all here in this figure 15.1 in a really simple and easy uh, to use format. Um, there's also, I wanted to highlight that there's a lot of bullet point pieces, again, easily uh, to understand and practical. So this one is how will you decide which form is best for your qualitative data collection? Uh, I just had a colleague call me yesterday and said, I heard this book is out. I've always been quantitative. Um, would this be helpful for me? And, you know, the second chapter kind of takes that quantitative thinking and expands it um, into a, a spectrum um, of understanding towards qualitative. And uh, she was talking about interviews. So, you know, do I do one on one? Do I do focus groups? What should I do? And uh, this chapter does a lot of simple walking through when someone's thinking about approaching and design and thinking about doing qualitative research for the first time. Certainly interviewing uh, using the internet and setting up your interview protocol uh, is going to be more and, po more and more popular with uh, our current situation. But in coming up with this protocol that you see here on, on the right hand side, I, I, I tried to put together the ideal interview approach that I would use from introduction to a small number of questions to how you close out the interview. Mm -hmm. And so I have had a lot of requests for this. And the next content topic is uh, validity too. We could go to that slide. So several reviewers uh, from the first edition said you need to talk more specifically about qualitative validity strategies and even put together a table that talks about the advantages and disadvantages and Mm -hmm. example, practical example of these strategies. So uh, this new edition goes into some of the popular strategies such as member checking. And I discuss how I've done that in the past, mm -hmm. uh, triangulating data, uh, using peer reviewers, uh, spending more time in the field. So uh, it really is an extended discussion of validity, which for those who have been around quality for years know that at first validity was not a term used, but I started using it around the year 2000 in an article and I've used it ever since. And I think it's become popular as a, a way to uh, uh, actually check the, the quality and the accuracy of an account. Mm -hmm. Since qualitative is very much of an interpretive approach to research. Mm -hmm. so the researchers making many interpretations. I think checking the, the final account, whether it's the codes or themes or the final story is, is very important. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and this table is actually quite long. So we tried to get all these different validity strategy ideas. Mm -hmm. um, so this is just a snapshot of the first two. How about the chapter on thinking about uh, like a qualitative researcher? Yes. Yeah, so yeah. I, I... I was particularly intrigued by this because I think, I think you know, working especially working with new and uh, and student researchers, you know, there are some things you know the techniques and the steps and that, but the thinking process uh, is a whole nother uh, you know area that in some ways is kind of hard to teach. So, um, so tell us about your approach to to that topic. Yeah, there's actually teaching ideas and activities in each chapter. And the first mm -hmm. chapter opens up with uh, a teaching tool that dad has used in his classes of looking at a picture and really seeing it in a way uh, that's expansive and sees the complexity of things and starts to get students to think like a qualitative researcher. 
Um, this one's always a little bit hard for me because I grew up in this. I think I have these innate thinking ways that are like a qualitative researcher from, you know, at age 10 participating in a, you know, being at the side on the side of a focus group for teenagers who were smoking um, and doing all sorts of things, being in a soup kitchen and around while people were observing. Um, but really it's this expansive, um, open way, seeing the complexity, um, maybe not always meaning lots of numbers, but looking at one or a few and looking at the depth of it. For me also being a social worker, which wasn't too much of a surprise from this kind of qualitative uh, mm -hmm. upbringing, um, it just made sense with the work that I was doing of understanding people, understanding sensitive topics, top complex topics, um, those who have been marginalized and not understanding just a singular view, but thinking of this multiple perspectives um, and the different views on a topic. Um, the other part that I really like about qualitative and is unique from quantitative is putting your own self into this, that mm -hmm. you bring biases as a researcher, as an observer, as a writer to this, and that is just part of the process and the piece. Um, I was just reading this, um, this book about school closures um, in Chicago the other week. And it's a, it's a qualitative, it's a book written on qualitative research mm -hmm. and studies about these school closures. And she talked about objectivity in a way that I never had heard before, where it was just... Uh, you know, it just, we are part of it and our biases and our social justice piece, they come in to the research and the understanding of it. Um, so I don't know, dad, thoughts yeah. on thinking like a quality of researcher? Yeah, well, you know, I'm currently working in uh, medicine and the health sciences and so many people uh, are new to qualitative research. They've done, they were trained as quantitative researchers and now they're at least open to the possibility of doing qualitative research. That's true also in many of the countries in Southeast Asia that I've been working with. Japan is very quantitatively oriented among the social scientists and the health scientists. Uh, Thailand, uh, Singapore, Indonesia, I can go down the list. Uh, so to bring someone over from quantitative research, I use, I thought the scaffolding approach, in other words, to add a new idea, but to start with where they are and then build to the new idea so that they can make that, that bridge. And one thing that I often say is that in qualitative research, you're not the expert, but the participant is the expert. Mm -hmm. So you need to listen carefully to them and you need to get as close to where they're talking about the problem as possible. You need to go out into the context, into the setting and, and visit with them. And so uh, that type of thinking, being open to other perspectives and moving away from variables to just exploring in a very open-ended way the central phenomenon that you're, you're looking at, uh, this is a transition for people. They've not, especially some quantitative, they've never thought this way before. And so begin thinking like a qualitative researcher is very important. Yeah, that getting close uh, made me think about our clinical scholars research. And in order to really get close and amplify these silenced voices of youth who'd cross the border by themselves, mostly teenagers and their parents, we went into churches mm -hmm. in Houston and did um, interviews. We were hoping to do kind of focus groups and we were able to do some through schools, um, mm. but really this group was so marginalized that at times we weren't able to get more than just one person who uh, was, un, you know, identified as mm. seeking asylum in the U.S. Mm. in a church. Uh, so really getting close to those stories and amplifying their voices. Yeah, yeah, I think, uh, uh, being able to think uh, not in a narrow sense of variables, but in the sense of looking at the entire picture and presenting in your qualitative study the complexity of the problem. Mm -hmm. 
uh, that that's qualitative research for me. And so what what do you think helps someone to have that mindset of curiosity and and openness? I think that uh, going through some act activities, mm -hmm. like we have an activity in this chapter where they're to look at this picture. Yeah, the first and, one. And and describe what they see. Mm -hmm. And some people will describe this in terms of counting things mm -hmm. and seeing the detail. And the qualitative researcher then might look at the broader picture and might actually compose a story about what's, what's occurring. Mm -hmm. So I think there are some activities that can be used in a, a class or in a workshop uh, that can help broaden a person's perspective. Mm -hmm. And that's the stance I take, we take. Yeah. Should we go I, to the next one? Yeah. I, I had else? yeah I had one one other thought I think thinking about what kind of um, questions you want to answer and how you can get to the complexity of the of the range of answers and understanding so often thinking about what what you're trying to understand and could qualitative really fit with this do you need to explore something further you know so doing some practice on like mm -hmm. what are things that someone wants to look into and understand yeah qualitative is definitely an exploratory approach i think where you're, you're wanting to learn from the participants and uh you know this is the slide about uh being culturally aware or not there's a chapter on uh being culturally aware and global qualitative research and you know, I'm working globally right now and I'm in, I'm in other cultures. And when I went to Thailand, for example, and talked about quality research, I studied the topics that they were researching. And at that time, and probably now too, tourism was a big topic. Mm -hmm. And so I brought in actual studies from tourism to kind of adapt to their culture. And then of course, working with someone from the other country. So I've got these great, great friends now spread across different countries in Southeast Asia, uh, quite a few friends here, here in Japan uh, that I cl collaborate with. And um, I think also uh, being sensitive to what is the methodological orientation of a mm -hmm. particular country. You know, knowing in Singapore that they're very quantitatively oriented in their training in their coursework and in their types of projects they're engaged in, I will go in and start with a primer on qualitative research. And I'll mention this 30 essential skills book as an example of uh, beginning to learn uh, qualitative research. So knowing, knowing the methodology. And uh, right now I'm trying to figure out, you know, from a, a worldview or a philosophy orientation, what is the world worldview that researchers bring to scholarly inquiry and qualitative research here in Japan. Mm -hmm. And it may not be some of these Western ideas of post-positivism or constructivism, but it might be more on some concepts of how they communicate with each other and how they disclose to each other. Uh, Ama, ama e is a concept that the communication writers talk about that's very culturally specific to Japan. So these are some of the cultural issues to be aware of. And I, I, we highlight several of these in this chapter. And, and I think this checklist also gives a really good example. There's lots of checklists in the book. Um, and I was looking at the first one, participate in cultural competency training. And I think that is a great first start when you're going into other cultures. Um, you, you know, if you're here in the US and working with other cultures, if you're globally working um, to really understand, uh, try to get an understanding of the culture and understand your own power uh, and privilege in it. Yeah, yeah. We're not, we're often not aware of the, the biases that we bring and right. the cultural orientation we have. So that, that openness is, is a very important first step. 
Well, I think this was a, a great segue from the previous point about thinking like a qualitative researcher that, mm -hmm. you know, whether we're working globally or within our own cultures, you know, being aware of the different perspectives and backgrounds that uh, participants bring or what uh, the communities uh, represent would be uh, very helpful. So, you know, one of the dilemmas that uh, many researchers are dealing with right now is that, you know, they can't do things the way that they had uh, planned to uh, approach them. Uh, and I think the cultural issues kind of, you know, play into that as well in terms of, um, you know, perhaps reaching, you know, different um, participant group in, in some ways, now that we can do research online, we have a chance to uh, interact with people we wouldn't be able to reach if we were just doing um, studies in our own community. So the cultural mm -hmm. awareness piece, I think, is, is, is more important than ever. So yeah. um, th here you have, you're talking about the scholarly writing, and certainly that's, mm -hmm. you know, a big uh, challenge that many people face. So another important area to include in your book. Yeah, I th we think that uh, good quality research uh, represents uh, is represented by good writing mm -hmm. by, by the scholar. Way back in uh, 1994, when I worked on my research design book for SAGE, I had a chapter on scholarly writing. And in that chapter, I tried to include all my favorite books on writing, writing strategies. And uh, so writing qualitatively was an important topic to begin addressing here in this book as well. And I, I reiterate some of the points I made earlier in other books on writing, you know, don't talk about your topic, but actually write out the drafts. The act of writing is, is actively working on a project. Uh, and then going through multiple drafts and getting feedback from others mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, these writing techniques continue to develop. Uh, one that I've been using here the last couple of days as I worked on my new edition of my uh, mixed methods book on a concise introduction to mixed methods research is to use the read aloud feature of Word. Have you ever used that, Joanna? You know, yeah. but they, they've improved that, that feature so much and you can slow down the speech. So you can have a, a narr narrator read back your text to you very slowly. And then while it's being read back, you can make corrections. And uh, that's been a, immensely helpful for me because hearing, hearing uh, a chapter and hearing the way uh, it sounds is just very valuable in thinking about whether I have the right content and whether I'm saying it in a very simple, straightforward way. And I'll have to admit, working culturally here, this has been a good learning exercise for me to learn how to say things in a very, very simple, straightforward way. So this is an important chapter on writing. Yeah, bo both of us really enjoy writing and we really love studying writing and we're constantly looking to refine our tools on writing. I just finished a three week workshop on uh, op-eds. It's through a great group called the mm -hmm. Op-Ed Project. Um, and so, you know, thinking about writing some stories into that and how that can support our qualitative writing and writing, mm -hmm. you know, case studies and pieces and making it engaging and, and making it simple and straightforward. So all of those pieces. Joanna and I have actually gone together to uh, writing workshops at the University of Iowa mm -hmm. and uh, participated in, in, in those workshops on how to write. And I think reading good, uh, literature, reading uh, uh, popular novels, studying how people present an interesting story. Mm -hmm. uh, these are all ways that the qualitative researcher can enhance their, their skills in this area. Especially new researchers. 
so I think there's there's an element of this book that's that's appealing to people that are beginning qualitative mm -hmm. researchers. Go to the next slide here, please. There. Yeah, and there we have. Well, Joanna, you want to talk yeah. about that the novice research? Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Um, so kind of uh, echoing what we were saying earlier is these are short and easy to use chapters. We have, you saw some examples throughout this presentation of checklists and outlines, lots of practical tools. We took one of our um, flyers um, and put it in this book for recruiting participants mm -hmm. and ideas for how to do recruitment. Uh, this book has a really strong methods approach and how we look at qualitative research. So uh, providing tools on rigorous uh, uh, methods up front, good protocols for data collection and good protocols for analysis. Um, the other key piece about this book is that it's a little bit nested. There, there's a next book that my dad uh, wrote um, with uh, Cresswell and Poth um, 2018. And that explores, so it's your framework book mm -hmm. for qualitative, and then that explores the five different traditions and methods um, of qualitative research. So narrative, phenomenology, grounded theory, ethnography, and case study. So kind of thinking of this as your framework, um, mm -hmm. and then moving on to uh, what is that design that you're putting your research into, all your tools. Yeah, I found a lot of people were using that five approaches book, which is, um, I see it as a more advanced book. They were using that as an introduction to quality research. And while I do introduce topics and then go into each one of the five approaches, I felt that an entire book for the novice researcher, for the, an introductory book was necessary. So this 30 essential skills is the beginning book. And then once you've completed this, then you can think about bringing a specific qualitative approach like ethnography, grounded theory, phenomenology. And then you could turn to uh, my second book uh, on qualitative research, choosing among and, and design, choosing among the five approaches as mm -hmm. a more advanced book. Mm -hmm. And we give kind of an appetizer. The 30th chapter is those five different uh, approaches. So starting to lead the reader into thinking about that. Yeah, so I was speaking recently to some uh, researchers. I was doing some webinars with researchers in Saudi Arabia and they wanted to study the five approaches. And my suggestion was to first read this chapter 30 which is an introduction to all five approaches to get an overview and then go into each one of the specific approaches one by one. And uh, that was the tactic, uh, the, the approach that they used. Yeah. So I think support for the, the beginning researcher is where this book uh, I think is most helpful. But, you know, experienced researchers may be curious about what are the methods that we use uh, that Joanna and I use in coding and what are the methods I, we use in sampling or in interviewing. And so the more experienced person may be reinforced or mm -hmm. may see a slightly different approach mm -hmm. uh, in this 30 Essentials book. Right. Well, I like the way that you've put together the, the kind of thinking and uh, uh, self-awareness side with the practical steps and the, and the tools for doing that. So um, is there anything else that you would like to uh, share before we close today? I just wanted to echo too, as now um, a more experienced researcher, I'm always going back. There's a section on a mm -hmm. great conclusion and I'm, you know, writing my piece out and then double checking that and seeing, you know, are there any other pieces that I want to add? So I think it is a great desk reference for mm -hmm. these different pieces of qualitative research to, you know, refer back to. And I'm working with a beginning uh, researcher in Tokyo right now. And I referred to the chapter on how do you write an abstract where I give a template 
of the components that actually go into an mm -hmm. abstract. Uh, and these templates, I think, are very useful for a novice researcher. And I've enjoyed working with Joanna. She's a talented researcher and uh, is a leading social work researcher as well. And uh, I think uh, that in terms of collaboration is an important point to find someone that works uh, at your level in terms of skills uh, that's easy to work with and collaborate with them on books rather than undertaking a book all by yourself, especially in your first books that you do. Right. And thanks a lot, Janet, for hosting us on this particular uh, discussion of the 30th Central Skills. Well, I hope so this is, uh, that the interview itself is useful to our readers and that they'll uh, take a look at this book, whether they're uh, thinking about something to use uh, in the classroom or, as you say, you know, looking for uh, some, you know, new approaches or kind of reminders of things that maybe they studied a long time ago, but right. it's been a while since they've used them, or mm -hmm. uh, people who you know, perhaps are uh, trying to incorporate some qualitative research into uh, a mixed methods uh, approach because, you mm -hmm. know, from what I am hearing from people, there are a lot of people who've been um, doing research like big data research and, you know, highly quantitative research who realize that they would like to also include some of the stories behind those numbers. So, uh, for people like that, I would think this would be a great um, first step. Mm -hmm. So thanks for uh, taking the time to talk with us. Sure. And thank uh, you. Thanks. I hope this will be a, a useful text. Everyone is viewing this.